you know, like South Park just kind of dawning over your horizon. And it was just, you know, insane. It was just like you couldn't, I could not learn enough about it. It was the greatest thing on earth. So how old were, we were getting way the hell, like we haven't even started the show yet. How old were you when you first got internet access? Oh, we haven't started the show? Start the show! <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode beta 99 for Wednesday, the 26th of October, 2016. This is the show where two lifelong friends talk about geek shit and whatever else comes to mind. I'm Amos, that's Kent, and that guy with the big-ass beard over there, he's all that matters tonight. That's Justin Robert Young. Sorry, Kent. No, uh, no, stop it. It's your show. Why the hell do I matter? I don't matter at all. <laughs> I'm just hanging out. I'm just shocked, man. I mean, come on. This is late for me these days. These days, I'm 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 in I'm in bed by 10:30. We just went 45 minutes, and it's like, yeah. Anyway, this will be great when we start the show. <laughs> I know the longest show pre-show of all time. That was that rivals Night Attack, I think. Uh, I think it was like a Night, Night Attack pre-show. It, it it rivals the funny part of Night Attack pre-show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Oh, oh man! See, I was gonna introduce Justin as someone that you might know from the Daily Orange or iTricks.com. Oh, I mean, yeah. if you went to Syracuse University between the years of 2001 and 2005, or uh, were a practicing or interested magician in uh, the 2008 to 2013 era, then yes, you would know me from one of those two places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amos, how's your week been, man? Has it been um, less chaotic than the pre-show was? No. 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 When, when I have a boring week or weekend, it, it like it, 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 like it, there's just something there's missing just something in, my in, my in my life. This weekend, no, I had more router trouble. These damn routers, like I can't get the shit to work right. I can flash it as many times as I want. I had to. Uh, I I could really get it, like the, the whole. Uh, SSHing into the router and and doing different so, Windows oh yeah. and Mac and it's just been crazy. Let, let's back up. Let's back up. You you were talking about flashing it. Are you talking about like whipping it out in front of it or well, like no, just no. lifting your shirt? Like what? You what think about yeah, just yanking your tool out and waving it at it like it's well, some kind of voodoo stick. Well, I'm not going to admit that on tape. Come on. I mean tape. They, yeah, they they oh. they they just started allowing me on uh, on school campuses again. I'm not going to start talking about how I whipped my tool out and and you know. Like, geez. Oh, man. Yeah. So, all right. So, router trouble. Did you ever figure it out, or is it still jacked up? Um, uh, I, I found a, a lower version. Well, I don't say version. I, I, I'm using the route, the default router uh, firmware, and I'm using that to the extent of its capabilities, whereas my desired effect would be one step beyond it. But uh, I've kind of given up for now. Uh, just other things to took precedence such as civilization six by the way yeah well is that any good oh my god it, it, it's but see it's a it's a it's it's a genuine paradigm shift in the way that you manage your cities because of how you have to lay everything out and you know the using the zones to build it up instead of just having all the buildings internal to the city itself um and there's some ai tweaks that need to take place but the expanded diplomacy and expanded trade and how religion takes a different role in it. It's really, really good. Um, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I'm still in my first playthrough, but I'm really enjoying it. Nice. Yeah. And, and of course, Dude, have- of course I'm a total nerd. So I got the, uh, the 25th anniversary edition, right? The lady at Best Buy oh, was like, nice. uh, cause I, I pre-ordered it and picked it up at Best Buy and she was like, Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll get that. She starts rummaging through like all these little single parts like these little little uh, um, bubble wrapped pieces that are like this big, like oh yeah yeah yeah, it's over here, it's over here. And I'm like no no, it's 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 right there. Like I can see it. It's the white box, right? Like, oh okay. And she goes like three bins past it and starts ruffling through like laptops. I'm like oh. like whoa no 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 no. It's 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 with the other video games. Oh it's a video game. She starts going through and she actually moves this. There's like three people that have pre-ordered along with me. She takes all those boxes, moves them out of the way to get to the. Uh, red box behind it, and I was like, Wait, "Really?" I mean, all right, but let me ask you a question. 
are you right now on your podcast seriously holding a random Best Buy worker in Alaska up to the standard high enough to understand that they would recognize the Civ 6 25th anniversary edition <laughs> box? I feel like the fact that you got it alone was an amazing occurrence. <laughs> I was going to comment on how I said it was a white box and there were several white boxes, but yeah, you're, you're right. The fact that I, I got it on release day is, is a miracle enough. I will uh, proceed to shut my trap and just be thankful for the small things. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, like, it's not that you can't complain about it, right? I'm just saying, like, like it is not exactly like, like oh, well, uh, I was downtown at, uh, you know, the, the civilization meetup and somebody screwed up getting me my box. It's like, no. I mean, population-wise, you guys are at a disadvantage in Alaska, right? <laughs> Let alone whoever's like, no, I want to work at the big box chain that'll be out of business in three years. <laughs> one, one of the two, by the way, because there's two Best Buys here. We don't have a, we don't have a, um, a Dave and Buster's, but two Best Buys. So that's kind of where we're sitting there. They, uh, they, not, no, Dave or Buster's made it up there yet. No, huh? no, they have plans, but they can't quite find a place because, you know, when you've been in a place that – Hey, we've had the same stores here for 200 years. Why are we going to invite yeah. more money? You know, that's that's silly talk. I so. mean, why do you all they already got you there. Like, <laughs> you know what? It's not like, like we're going like, to drive down the street and go to Disneyland, right? Like, you know, they're like whatever, suckers. Like, you're already you're here now. Like, we don't need to sell you on this anymore. You moved to the furthest you moved to a state that is so ballsy. It said to Canada, whoa, whatever. Like, we can do better than that. <laughs> yeah. Holy crap. Yeah, we, we went and uh, got a rental car today because of um, – we, we, we had both of our vehicles in the shop for different reasons, and they were supposed to be – it's supposed to take one and then swap them out and then, you know, bring the other one home, right? Well, they screwed it up, yeah. and it ends up we don't have either one. So the, the dealership – got us a, a rental car and the first rental car they got us, we went to go get it. Neither my wife nor I smoke. And we, we opened the doors and it was like, mm -hmm. and my wife's like, ah, someone smoked in there. And I'm like, they, they smoked. All right. They were, they were smoking, you know, a couple different brands of things. Let's just say that. And the lady that was working at the car rental place, she's like, what are you talking about? Like she had no clue. Oh, and it just, man. it just reeked Perfect. of the reefer. Which I'm not complaining about. It's just a matter of I don't need to be driving on base with you know a marijuana smelling car. That that tends not to work out very well for me. Yeah, the 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 cops on a military base don't tend to take kindly to that. Yeah, not so much. So Justin, how was your so week? Wait, so wait, what would have? Oh, I guess. Well, I mean, there's restrictions on like alcohol and stuff as well, right? Like, because like like what if they legalize it in Alaska, like or federally, let's say. Um, uh, yeah. Have federally legalized first of all and, and yeah. they will probably regulate the shit out of it you, uh, you still with, can't with smoke within 50 feet of a government building so i'm not i'm not thinking they're gonna let marijuana right. on base anytime soon they they have yeah, cut they wouldn't allow it on base they that's, have cut dependence on base with marijuana and kicked them off base permanently uh things like that it's it's, it's like this little it's a really strange gray area um yeah i don't know I blame the 60s because there was like this whole thing where like it was like, oh, no, weed was for the long hairs. And like, you know, like then they were like yelling at yeah. people when they came back from Vietnam, and like, like, screw you, hippies, like grass is never going to be in the military <laughs> when it's like weed should only be in the military. <laughs> right? Like, you know, right. when you're dealing with like physical and mental trauma and the idea that you are either like on you are set to go like you have actual shit that you could probably use a little mental vacation from like you know that's that seems seems ridiculous it, seems it should be designed for military people <laughs> and like and not like you know bongo players oh you haven't you having problem uh, eating the shitty food we got here try this oh you're yeah. having problems sleeping here try this <laughs> yeah i i like i it's it, just kind of one of those, I guess, those weird quirks of like how life worked out. Imagine the world where the hippies were the alcohol drinkers, and and the and and and, and the the military folk were the weed smokers. I feel like it, it might be a more optimized world. Yeah. Um. As Crunchy says in chat room, thanks, Obama. Right. 
it's always his it's, fault. It's always I think his it w- fault. I wonder, you know, it, like five years from now, will we still be saying thanks, Obama? Will it still be his fault? Mm. No, I feel like thanks, Obama was because it wasn't. Well, no, thanks, Bush. But thanks, Bush was serious. Like no one really said thanks, Bush. Ironically, <laughs> everyone right. everyone should thank the Bush. I'm just saying, you know, that's just one of those I things. Think- Thankful if you're, for th- if you're yeah. lucky to have it, then yeah. <laughs> um, so actually, this came up a few weeks ago on our show, Justin. I wonder what your take is. Why does everyone on Twitter call President Obama dad? What Twitter accounts are you following? That's like, the like same you, thing I you, asked him. Like, I- <laughs> bro, nobody that I follow does this. But if you go to to the at POTUS, every time it posts. Like, probably 30 out of every 35 tweets is dad, 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 dad. Okay, well, the next time that you state that question, please include that regular context, uh, because that would really clarify the question. Why do people call President Obama dad? I don't know, bro, because he's, like, a lot of people who's on Twitter's dad's age, or maybe, like, the age of their dad that they... Mo- most like to remember or or feel that was at their prime i mean i don't know we're a nation of daddy issues you know, that's, <laughs> so it doesn't necessarily shock me but but i i have never seen it so it is news to me that so many <laughs> folk on twitter are calling him dad yeah, it's yeah just one of those super weird things that i that i i don't know i don't know I mean, it's certainly i don't know if it's a gay thing specifically but i mean that's certainly uh a, a gay that's a it's something i've heard like playfully in gay culture in san francisco obviously is, is a lot of the like dads and daddies and stuff like that so oh, right. now i do have a question um I grew up in Southern California for the most for the most of my childhood in uh, Palmdale, Lancaster. Um, and even when I was young, San Francisco is known as like the the gay culture center of the of the country. Is it sure. just San Francisco though? Is that like is that like something San Francisco owns, or does it bleed over to, into Oakland and and you know all those other areas up there? Is that is well, is, is, is the stereotype is kind of true? Into Oakland a little bit. Uh, well, listen, I mean, uh, San Francisco, and I think rightfully so, is very, very proud of its gay culture. It's been, you know, a, a leader in, in, you know, gay rights and stuff like that mm-hmm. for, for many, many years. So uh, I think that's a very well-deserved element of that city. Oakland certainly is also very gay-friendly. Um, you know, I think the, the the issue with Oakland is that you, you've certainly seen it gentrified, and if you're going to you know, trace back what its lineage is activist wise, it would be less gay and more racial, right? I mean, Oakland right. is the home of the Black Panthers. Oakland is uh, a a city that Ashley and I like to joke, uh, riots on a national level. So like if, if you know, a, a police officer shoots somebody across the country, uh, uh, we, we riot in Oakland because <laughs> Oakland is so in tune to those issues. Uh, I guess going from that, you know, as Oakland has gentrified, I, I think you've seen, and I don't know, I, I don't know if I, I want to pin it to that. I mean, I, I want to naturally pin it to that because that was when I moved here was as gentrification in Oakland had kind of started to really pick up steam. But the odd thing is that Oakland has a, a reputation as being a lesbian like that there's like like the Oakland lesbian is kind of a thing. Really? And so there's like a difference in the in the gay male culture and the lesbian culture. Oh wow. Hmm. That's a new one on me. I have not heard that. Oh. It it actually was something that I was very surprised by when I I mean I I have through my life lived traditionally in fairly gay friendly areas like uh South Florida, Fort Lauderdale actually or Broward County technically has the largest per capita uh, gay area, or it's the largest per capita, the gayest area per capita, that's what I want to say. Um, Because there's, you know, or I guess Fort Lauderdale is, because of this neighborhood called Wilton Manors, which is very popular and is a huge gay culture kind of place, right? I live in New York City, now out here in the Bay Area. Uh, But all through that, until I moved here, I really was unaware that there was a lot of cultural difference between gay men and lesbians. And, and when I thought about it more, 
like uh, after kind of meeting, you know, what I now understood as like, you know, people who are in a larger culture and therefore, you know, can uh, create norms as we all do, as sports fans do, as, mm-hmm. as you know, uh, uh, cultural religious folks do, right? Like it's just, it's when there is a large gathering of like-minded people, there tend to be shared behaviors. Right. Um, and it was the first time that I realized that what I had previously thought of as gay culture was really more gay male culture because gay male culture, I think, tends to be a little louder. And I don't mean that in any kind of like behavioral way. I mean, like just by volume, like mm. it's just a more colorful kind of, uh, of, right, of right. culture compared more, to more publicized, more. Uh, uh, I don't even know if it's publicized. It's just like if you walk down the street and you see, you know, a a a, a chick in a flannel search getting into her Subaru, you're, you don't think of it as much as, you know, yeah, a okay. dude, a got, yeah. Top, right. <laughs> I gotcha. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and that's of course not to say, then this is always like, Oh my God. And this is the kind of shit where it's like, you know, it's going to be dug up if I, you know, get a, a, a an important media job in 40 years. And then it'll be like, <laughs> look what antiquated fucking caveman this person yeah. is. Because Listen, it's like, three of course, ass is talk about something that they're not even involved. I know. This, this <laughs> gender no. straight, no, no, fuck all explains gay culture, right? <laughs> and that's so. It's not to say that everybody is everything. It's just that that's a thing that does exist within that culture. You know, it's, I don't think that that's really you know uh, debatable. Uh, so, Justin, we didn't really discuss this before the show, and maybe we should have. We should have mentioned it. Um, I'm the the resident foot in mouther, so you know I'm I'm the one that typically says the things that are I'm gonna regret in five years when I retire and I'm trying to get a job. Just uh, yeah, know, that's, <laughs> so I, I appreciate I appreciate you taking off a little bit of the heat, you know. <laughs> uh, listen, man, I'm trying to look out for you. You know, I'm trying, we're trying to get this party rolling. Hey, uh, hey, Kent, man, you uh, you you had some weekend. What's that now? Ah, uh, see, he's so so good on picking up transitions. I said uh, you had some fun this weekend. I see some stuff in the show notes here that uh, occupied your time. Uh, no, see, that's the thing. I've had probably the most standard, boring ass last week. Um, so I'm not even going to tell something that I did. I'm going to tell a story that my coworker told me. So at at our job, one of the things that we do is for like new new people that are coming in, uh, we provide briefings and uh, get them set up for. Uh, you know, what their new job is going to be. And we had this person coming in uh, just a few days ago that my coworker was like, all right, I, I got to make sure I get to work on time so that I can get this all ready and everything like that. Right. That's a high so standard. You, well, H- having to be work, right. at work on time. That's, I mean, that might be too much. Well, you know, that, that, that is a, um, that's one of those things that every now and then you really have to shoot for that. This was one of those days for her. <laughs> Uh, no, but she had a lot of stuff to get ready for, for the day to get ready for the meeting with this guy. So she's on her way to work, going through traffic and everything. And she gets behind this truck that has all these moving boxes and shit on it. And she's like, oh crap, I got to get around this guy. Just as she starts to pull around him, this box tumbles off of the truck and gets caught under her car, like in the wheel wheel. And she's dragging this fucking box down the street. She's like, oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me. So she pulls the car over and the guy that was in the truck is like, oh shit, I just saw what happened pulls over and just as she gets onto the rumble strip the box like splits apart and papers just go all over the fucking highway and hmm. she's like oh my god the guy gets out of the truck and comes comes you know like oh my god you know sorry about the box falling off and all this kind of shit it's the guy that she's meeting with to set up for work oh nice no that, <laughs> he's like oh that works well this is convenient <laughs> that's a that's fortuitous yeah, so that was by far way more exciting than anything that happened to me this week. That's uh, that's that's unfortunate. Let's just say that it's unfortunate. Um, <gasps> yeah, it's unfortunate you had such a boring weekend. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, it's unfort- Like, why didn't you do anything interesting? Like, shoot a gun in the air, or like high five, uh, like a small animal or something. Well, you know, I am in New Mexico, and that is kind of the so, standard thing to do. So, so, so I'm small, trying to, to small stray animals. from the culture. 
Small animals are hard to come by in New Mexico. <laughs> well, unless it's a rattlesnake or a scorpion. <laughs> those, are, those are plenty here. Screw that. Um, <laughs> hey, man, uh, so I, I, I mentioned something to you a couple weeks ago. Uh, speaking of Justin Robert Young, in fact, we were mentioning, I was listening to the jury show, and he had an episode where he was kind of stumbling over his words and laughing. And, and I had started listening to my podcast at 1.2 speed and trimming out all the silence. So the normal, hey, let's get this figured out and keep going that Justin sometimes does on this podcast, end up, you know, the, the minute and a half that it probably was, ended up being about 10 seconds of just the awesomest chipmunk jury sounds ever. Um, <laughs> since then, I have escalated myself up to 1.5 speed. And I am now at the same speed of listening to my podcasts as Tom Merritt. And I feel accomplished in that because I've tried this several times before and quit, never, never quite got the hang of the 1.5 speed, but I had to ease myself into it. And thus far, I've caught up on all but three shows, all of which are DiamondClub.tv shows. So, <laughs> Oh, my God. I, I've never yeah. even tried the sped up thing. Yeah, it's once you get used to it, it's amazing. Like the it, like your shows typically are an hour long, and my drive into work yeah. is right about fifty five minutes. So it usually works out pretty good. Now I've got I've got about twenty minutes left at the end of an hour long show. I can knock out like a a ninety nine percent invisible, or most of a DTNS show. Like it it's so much um, it's so amazing. I'm getting thirty percent more show than than you know fifty percent more show. Guess- whatever, however the math works out, I don't math. I guess that's the thing is is I always feel like I'm like any podcast or radio show that I listen to because it's my like profession like I need to be studying what they do like I need to be studying exactly how they say it and mm-hmm. I need to be understanding like cadences and shit like that yeah, no, yeah. exactly and I feel exactly the same way I don't think I could ever do the speed up thing because just like Justin said I I study this. It's kind of like research for me to listen to other shows, even though I also enjoy them. Um, but other, but besides that, even it's like, it's like you're fucking with the art of it. In my opinion, if, if you listen to it fast or you, you skip over any white space. I, 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 I'm, I'm very tempted to go there, but I cannot go there. I, I, I can't go to the, like, no, the sanctity of my voice. Is in <laughs> the, is in the rich timber. Right. Because it's like I don't know. I feel like that's that's just uh, inserting a head directly up the anus. Right? So I, I, I'll, I'll say a couple things real quick. Is that um, they've gotten the podcast at least Pocket Cast, which is my preferred podcatcher. It's gotten good enough on its little speeding up that it doesn't change the the pitch of the voices. So it makes it a lot easier to consume because you're not actually changing the voices. It's just shortening it out a little bit. And I'm, I'm not sure how. The little magic oh, works. So, it, so it, it pitches it down so it doesn't sound chipmunky. Right, right. It, it actually sounds just just normal, but it trims the silence in between. You know, it trims the silence and then speeds it up. But what I'm doing is the whole reason I started this is because I look back and I'm like, I'm like a hundred episodes back on Cord Killers, which I know Jackie kills me for every time I mention it. I'm a hundred episodes back in Cord Killers. I'm like. 200 episodes back on Nerdist. Like, uh, seriously? You shouldn't, okay, but you should listen to Nerdist and not listen to Cord Killers, and, and, and not because I think that one show is better than the other, uh, but Cord Killers is a new show. Right. Like, you know, that's that's meant to not be caught up with, right? That's that's what Jackie keeps telling me, but there, there's something about... Uh, the shows evolve as you go along. So I'd at least have to listen to like certain episodes, like every, every couple episodes, every 10 episodes or whatever, just to keep up with the changes and the, and the differences in the show. But those shows I find very that's entertaining. A sign, that's a sign of OCD. Like that's something that you should get checked out. Like then, that's, that's like picking up pennies and, and saving all of them. Like, you know, you're, <laughs> that's, you're a hoarder, but for podcasts, like that's, it's not healthy. But I'm trimming them down. Like I, I've made up so much space. Going from uh, almost 600 back to now I'm like 300, and it's just been in the last month that I've been doing this. I'm going to be caught up by Christmas, and it's going to be amazing because then I can just relax. It's going to be great. <laughs> okay, stop. Relax now. At ease. Like, you are, you are, uh, you are fine. You've 
You've you've you've served this country well. <laughs> this country speaking, of podcasts. Speaking of, podcasts <laughs> speaking of podcasts and not having enough podcasts, uh, I might be doing an, a new one in the coming months. Uh, do you guys watch Doctor Who? I, Amos, actually, I know that you don't get. I've even half never shit. seen a full episode in my entire life. As sad as that is, because the half episodes I have seen were awesome. Yeah, Justin, do you watch uh, Doctor? Or have you? Yeah. Oh no, certainly. Yeah, with the the new the new series, not the old one. Right. And see, that's the thing. So Doctor Who has always been like a a gap in my nerd cred, because when I when I was growing up, because it's a BBC show, I didn't grow up in England, so I used to get Starlog magazine, which was probably the nerdiest fucking thing on the news rack when I was a kid. It was all oh, this. Yeah, I'm down, I'm down with it. Yeah, and it seemed like at least every other episode it either had Dr. Who on the cover or there was a feature article or something about Dr. Who. And I'm like, what the fuck is this Dr. Who that all these other nerds are talking about? So finally, when the new series came out, then it, Dr. Who became a thing again, what, probably 10 years ago that the new series started. Ew, uh, geez. But yeah. I didn't want to, yeah. I didn't want to get into it at that point because I'm kind of that completist guy. Like I want to get all the in jokes. I wanted to start from the beginning, but I could never get my hands on it. And my girlfriend was watching from like season one of the new series. So I've caught a fair amount of it just because osmosis, just being in the room. And I've kind of become a fan of it. Well, my girlfriend and I decided that we're going to do a project. We are going to start from the 1963 series from the very first episode and try to watch well, until we shoot ourselves in the head, probably, but watch from the very beginning and see how far we can get and then podcast the experience of that. So wait a minute. Was that the old dude? Yeah. The super old dude. Right. Okay. That was in 63. Wasn't it in black and white? Yes. It was in black and white. <laughs> 1963. In fact, the, very first episode aired the day that Kennedy got shot. Good. Oh, <laughs> I'll show him. <laughs> right. now, now that's actually an interesting piece of, tr of trivia that I will never use again. Right. Yeah. Well, it was. It's interesting because the first episode actually tanked in the ratings because of the news coverage just took over all media. So they played the episode again like a week later, and it redeemed itself that's what saved the show was the decision to replay it wow. they were just gonna cancel it because of the, the shitty ratings um yeah no i i i've always kind of wanted to go back and watch uh the old doctor who but I, I've, I've kind of not done it out of fear <laughs> because you know, the art changes, art evolves. Like what is amazing then might not be amazing now. Every once in a while, you you find something that was revolutionary, and there are still elements of it that like either echo at the highest levels or are so influential. It's very interesting to watch it. I just always wonder that you know, I that, that like Doctor Who is just one of those things that was a byproduct of the fact that there was so little science fiction on television that like this thing that kind of did any element of that was, was so popular. Right. Yeah. Here's, and that, that might be the point of it. Um, I don't know. We'll find out. I'll, we'll definitely report on it. So here's my thing about Dr. Who. I understand that it's this huge nerd thing and you know, it's, it's pretty good depending on which season you watch and who you are. Everybody likes at least some of it. Right. But mm -hmm. I, I have found that when it comes to time to talk about Dr. Who and other major nerd things it is just a lot easier to say i've never seen it and take the hit on your nerd cred than it is to say oh yeah i've seen some of it and then not have seen the same episodes or the same seasons that the person talking to you has seen it's just easier because you just cut the conversation completely and they, they try to engage you on a higher level. Right. You can't. It, up, so it's just like, okay, this is pointless. It, and it's, it's just easier. Hey, just go ahead and kick me in the nuts now. Don't draw and you know, quarter me later. It just, I'd rather just take the take the hit right now and move on with the life and find something we can actually talk about than fumble fuck my way through whatever season you happen to be talking about. It's just easier. Well, no, I mean, no, here's, here's the thing with Doctor Who. If you've watched all of the current series, 
then you can say, yes, I watch Doctor Who. And then if they come at you with that Tom Baker shit, just be like, come on, man. <laughs> like, you knew what I was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, when somebody says, hey, if, if you know, did you watch Friends? I'm like, yes. Yeah, I've seen, uh, all, I've got half the episodes memorized. Like, that's just something I totally geek out about. Loved it. Didn't watch it when it was on TV. Loved it afterwards, you know? Um, but yeah, Doctor Who's just not one of those things that I, I've, I've got the time or the willpower or the interest to, to sit through. I'm just, I'm just have to be that it's guy. It's a little bit of a Pringles thing, though, man. Like, once you start, you can't stop. <laughs> like, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty rad like that. You could, you, I, I was working on building some magic trick. I forget even what the magic trick was for Andrew, but I had to build a million of them. And so I wound up banging out like the first three seats. Seasons of, of of Doctor Who just crushing it episode after episode. Mm. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, Justin, are you a collector of of geeky shit? No, uh, more for my own sanity. I, I I'm not a good pack rat. Like yeah. I don't um I don't I don't frame a lot of things. I don't or I don't like enshrine them. I don't have a desk, so there's not a lot that I can like put on a desk or anything so um, so, uh, I'm gonna, so yeah no I'm, I'm not good with that i want to tell I, you right I, now i want to i want to tell you right now that you need to stay away from geek and gamer gear.com don't go there don't bother seeing it geek and gamer gear.com they got tons of collectible shit that you were just going to actively avoid and all the stuff all the nostalgia I'm stuff all the right current now. stuff no I'm justin to- don't 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 yeah, do this don't to yourself, man. Don't, don't do this. Gamer Gear. Geek, especially the letter N, oh, oh. GamerGear.com. Don't go there. Don't, they just, they've got so much stuff, uh, so many different things to, to look at and to buy and, and complete your collections on. And they, they have, they've got onesies, as, um, as Stacy found out. Um, they, they've, got, they've got collectible toys. They've got game controllers. Like they, they have all the cool geeky shit that you do not want to start collecting because we all know you're going to try to cl- collect them all, and that's just that's just trouble. That's just trouble. And gamer Wait. gear a and or it's no. spell out this URL. It's it's g e e k n g a m e r g e a r dot com. Geek the letter n gamergear dot com. But Justin, I'm telling you, you don't want to go. Like you you don't want to go. No, I'm going. Right now, no. It's, oh my god, it's just trouble. You especially, you don't want to go there because the prices are so low that it's easy to spend or buy a lot of things for very little money. Yeah. Well, where do they get it? This is so cheap. It's like they got it from China or something. This is crazy. Yeah, like, yeah. And see, Amos, Amos, we we cannot tell him the discount code because oh, yeah, yeah. Be the last cheap. thing you want to do is use ritual misery as all one word. You don't don't do that. You get your when you check out because. You'll get 10% off your first purchase. It'll encourage you to come back and buy even more cool, geeky shit. Like, Justin, this is a rabbit hole you just don't need to go down, man. Wait, you said that they had onesies? Yeah, yeah. They, 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 at least they did three weeks ago when Stacy looked. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, they have beanies. They've got um, they've got a fair oh, amount of... You know, you know them little bobblehead sons of bitches that everybody collects? Them little things? Yeah, they got those. Um... Every time I see them at Walmart, they creep me out because they got the big head and 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 they're in the, like a box. It just it gives me a little uh, a little disorder right there. It just makes me feel weird inside. Um, yeah, no, I'm getting a Ravenclaw beanie. See, <laughs> <laughs> telling you, man, it's just it's just the start of of the end right now. <laughs> oh, so stop yourself! Stop yourself! <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, I'm pulling myself away so I can continue to do the podcast. See? But it's See? only my commitment to this show that I'm, I'm doing. <laughs> All right, um, um, go ahead, Kent. I was just gonna ask you guys if you've tried VR. Uh, uh, Justin I, I has. Uh, I I tried the uh, what was that little the Virtual Boy? Um, That's the one that I've tried too. Yeah, I tried. I, I got pretty good at that little flying game they had on there with the little red lions and stuff. Man, I was really, I was kicking ass. I was, I was the best person nobody, in Sears. Man, I had top score in Sears. Yeah, no, nobody got good. At yeah, that. I, I never yeah. actually saw one in the in the wild, but I, I, you know the little display unit at Sears. Man, I was rocking that thing. What's up? I got a I got a Virtual Boy from Blockbuster. I <laughs> rented it from Blockbuster for a weekend. <laughs> God, I'm sorry. No, it was great. Oh. I very much 
enjoyed it. Not enough to like ask my mom for one, but like <laughs> I enjoyed. We had a very torrid love affair, me and the virtual boy for yeah. a weekend. Yeah. Um, so did you get sexual assaulted when you played the virtual boy? Do you think? Did that ever happen, or could that have happened? No, that did not. That was not a network device. But on the Vive, when you're playing um, multiplayer stuff, you know that's uh, certainly more of a possibility. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I I read a blog. Uh, I don't know, three or four days ago, I read that this lady that she's been sexual assaulted a couple of times in real life. So she knows, you know, the feelings that that one gets when they're sexually assaulted. And yeah. she was, I, I think it was the vibe actually that yeah. her brother-in-law had, and she was trying it out and she was sexually assaulted in a game. Well, someone like virtually groped her in this game. And she said that it produced the exact same feelings as when she was assaulted in real life. Um, and I was just in her, in her experience. Correct. Absolutely. Now, granted, I mean, she admits in this blog that, you know, you don't actually have the physical sensation. So there's no like actual physical thing that happened to you, but the yeah. is associated with it. The violating, um, you know, overtones were present just as strongly as when someone actually grabbed her in real life. I was just curious if, as someone who's used the Vive or, or any VR system, is that like, is it that real? Is it something that's going to get into your head where you could be violated in that sense? Uh, well, this is, I mean, this is a really is way it, to ask, a really weird way to ask how real is virtual reality? That's yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> that's actually kind, really yeah, that. kind of what I I'm mean, asking. But. Uh, it's the most immersive experience that I've had in, in those like in, in that genre for sure. But, um, you know, I guess, yeah. I mean, if, if your question is, is that experience real enough that you could reasonably understand that if somebody came in with prior trauma, could they uh, re-experience elements of that prior trauma? <laughs> By the way, our lights are set to dim at 10 o'clock. Is this, is this like a California brownout thing going like, what's up? No, this is, this is, what's it called? This is our hue lights. We have them automatically set to dim so, so, at a certain time. So these are your own personal botnets is what you're saying. Okay. No, you, you set up, man, you got to get on this hue light thing, man. Like, it's great. So you set up your own, like, if then, like, recipes uh, and, uh, and, and, and so it'll, you can set it to do whatever you want anyway. All right. So is, is the vibe real enough that somebody who was previously sexually assaulted could feel sexually assaulted? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't not buy that, but I do think that it's probably something that is fresh in her mind. You know, I, I, I don't know if somebody that was without that trauma, you know, uh, uh, cause I had read that article felt somebody or saw somebody because you're not feeling anything. You right. saw somebody doing the same things that that person was doing to her. Um, I don't think that that would immediately trigger that. Right. I, but I think if you have previously had those experiences, yeah, I mean, I could, I think it is realistic enough that, 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 that could happen. Mm, wow. I, yeah. Go ahead, Amy. We, in, in the Air Force, and I'm guessing DOD-wide, we have so much sexual assault training and, and like how to avoid it, how to keep your friends out of it, how to spot it when it's happening, how to inter interfere and interject and, and, uh, and you know, step up, step in, whatever other gimmick they have right now, you know, place a green dot on, on their eyeball or what it's, there's so many different programs and all this other stuff. And, you know, um, sexual assault is one of those things that, whether or not it's it's like I, all I can think of right here is being in a virtual reality game and something like this happening and there's going to be a military member going to jail because we're so hypersensitive about it right now. Like he sexually assaulted me in the game. He groped my buttocks. Oh, my God. Throw him in jail. And I know well, I know this I mean, kind of overblown. But it's, it's, all right. So there's a game that Ashley and I both played a lot of called Hover Junkers. And the idea is that you are out in these various maps on these like floating, um, you know, uh, 
boats, basically, these hovercraft, and you are uh, shooting the person that's driving it. And so you're all driving, right? It kind of feels like a little one part twisted metal, one part first person shooter, right? Okay. Uh, but if in the middle of each round, you're all in the lobby of this bar, right? Or you're all at this bar, which is the lobby of the game. And at that point, really, all you can see is people's hands and faces, right? And, you know, at that point, every, all you see is just this blur of hands and everything. And some people, like, you know, try to do a little, like, you know, J-O kind of thing or or put their hand in somebody's face. Like, I I, I think in, in those kinds of situations... Um, you know, uh, uh, people are going to interpret that differently, you know, and, and that says more about uh, the world we live in than it necessarily says about virtual reality, mm -hmm. is that, you know, the, the world we live in produces people for which carry things into this different experience. So would a, would a, uh, would a, would a virtual reality a sexual assault equivalent or whatever be like the the modern age version of the uh of, of the halo teabagging yeah i mean i think that would be something that would probably be a little bit more traumatic and certainly as as the vive uh, uh continues to grow you know I, I think you might you might get something like that where you are you know in in a certain situation as somebody it looks and feels more physically like somebody is taking advantage of you. Right. So do you think that, you know, here we are kind of on the cusp of the, the, the great awakening of VR. Should we, you know, I say we, should the industry come up with some standards for like, um, I don't know, safety mechanisms, I guess, like a checkbox that you can check where nobody can come within three feet of me or anything like that? Uh, I mean, maybe it, it depends on how much of a problem it is and, and how much, you know, I think when you have a new paradigm of video games, you want to learn from what the old paradigm maybe didn't ever really get right. And so I think it's safe to say that in an era of team chat and shit for like, you know, PCs and consoles, that if you could invent a totally new paradigm is there anything that you could do to make it better going forward to future proof it as much as you could in a way that spamming and chat and stuff like that and, and just vile shit that comes out when you're, you're pr providing an open VoIP line for people, uh, you know, has, has learned from. And, and I think, you know, that's, you see that in like Hearthstone and the fact that you have to be friends with somebody before you can actually type something to them. Uh, and, and you can only, talk in one of six emotes yeah. during the game. Um, and and they've, yeah. they've, in fact, modified the emotes so that you can't do the, uh, was it the good game? The good game emote no, anymore? Thank you. Thank you. They were, they were upset with the, um, with the sarcastic thank you. So they create, or sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's it. it oh, was yeah. Sorry. Um, and so they, uh, they, they made it a sarcastic wow. Yeah, it's. I mean, but you have things like that where Blizzard is change, literally changing an aspect of the game. You know, ch making making it different. When are we going to see things like that actually creeping into virtual reality to stop these things like sexual harassment and you know? Uh, I mean, I think this is a this is a story, and I don't mean this to degrade what the lady wrote, right? Uh, because listen, that's why uh, you know it's published on Medium. That's it's you're supposed to express personal stories and and this one resonated however i do think that part of it is that it's one of those like uh dope headline generator kind of stories where right. it's like you just hit the scramble word button of like hot like like things that people pay attention to and again this is going to come off as incredibly demeaning to this woman's experience but just for random people who are seeing it as a link on twitter or on facebook I was sexually assaulted in VR, you it's, know. Yeah, it's, it's like very immediate clickbait. Yeah. yeah. It's like it's like, you know, I got run over playing Pokemon Go. Like there's just <laughs> there's there's these certain things that are just catnip to mainstream video. Yeah, 
Well, I think there's an element to it as well where we want to shit on whatever the cool new thing is. We want to find something wrong with it. Like, why should we hate this new thing? And that's I think that's part of the um, the allure, the clickbait allure to things like that. Well, I mean, I think but 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 what made this one big is that it, it broke into mainstream. You know, it's not that's not even like, yes, I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of video game press, because video game press is very much about that. But this story broke out because I don't read a lot of video game press and I knew what the story was because it broke out into more of a mainstream audience. And and normally it's like video game stories that break into the mainstream are either money related. This thing made a jillion dollars mm-hmm. or negativity. Like right. it's it's will your brain turn into a fermented pig's foot if you play Candy Crush well, more at eleven? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, the, the answer to that is obviously yes, but I mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I the, that's, the, there's prostitutes in Grand Theft Auto. Because yeah. the funny thing is that there is elements of our there are elements of our culture that are kind of I think softly deemed as low art, right? Um, for which mainstream culture, like a podcast, <laughs> podcasting's one of them. Well, no, podcasting we got saved because NPR got in it. So, yeah, so right. now, yeah. <laughs> so now, so now the elites love it, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, so this is the only time that I will ever uh, openly praise Garrison Keillor. Um, <laughs> uh, but although this is more of an Ira Glass thing, big ups to Ira Glass right now. Um, but no, like uh, video games, wrestling for sure. That like the only time that you ever hear any stories like that are either su- gigantic success, which again is kind of spun as a like, oh my god, yeah, the, the surely we're gonna fall off the side of the earth now that video games are making billions of dollars, yeah. like or or uh, wrestling or it's tragedy, you know, like in wrestling, it's like you know it took wrestlers dying for mainstream media to pay any kind of attention to it. Speaking of, uh, of, of wrestling news, there's a new Vince McMahon conspiracy theory. Ken, you got a, you, you got a little, uh, little, some details on this. Cause I don't watch wrestling. I'm not one of the in, in crowd on this one. Like you two are. Um, sure. I, uh, but I know who Vince McMahon is. And anytime I see conspiracy theory, my, my ears perk up because, because that's just the type of person I am. So Kent, what's going on with this? Well, there, there's, yes, there's certainly a conspiracy theory. Uh, Vince McMahon, well, it's, it's a well-known thing that Vince McMahon and Donald Trump have worked together for probably the better part of 30 years, like 20, 30 years. They have been business partners, yeah. I mean, he is, he staged events at Trump properties, and, uh, and, and then, of course, Donald Trump was uh, a huge part of a WrestleMania probably 10 years ago. Right. Yeah. And Vince McMahon, you know, obviously he's got this this multi-billion dollar company, the WWE. He's very good at what he does. And one of the things that he does to get his stars over is he creates what's called a monster heel. Yeah. And it's it's the big bad guy that you just build him up, build him up, build him up. He's unbeatable. He's this awful, awful, awful person. And basically all that is is, is setting up an opponent for the the baby face, the good guy, the hero to defeat to make the hero an even bigger hero. Basically. Hero, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, the conspiracy theory is that for the last five to ten years, Vince McMahon has been plotting this real-life monster heel and has made it come to fruition in Donald Trump. And it's going to come out either sometime at the um, concession speech or shortly after where... Donald Trump is going to reveal to the world that this was all a work and that Vince came up with this idea and the entire point of him running for president was to ensure Hillary Clinton's election. Um, I mean, number one, uh, if that were the case, it would be the greatest story in, in <laughs> American politics ever, right? <laughs> right. Especially if he sook to if 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 he if he wanted to take credit for it, right? He would be the greatest hero in all of liberalism. You know, he <laughs> would he would be. I mean, that that'd be the only place that he could retreat to. 
um, because the 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 ire with which you know he would be he would be barbecued with would be um, you know of, of of such an insane magnitude. Uh, the other part about this is that Vince McMahon would have to be very very committed to it because I believe he and his wife Linda, who ran as a Republican for Senate, yep. um, have donated like five or six million dollars to one of the Trump super PACs. So uh, that would be a tremendous commitment <laughs> by them to the bid. Now listen, it's not it wouldn't be the first time that Vince McMahon has needlessly sank millions of dollars into a failing venture as the XFL, you know, looms yeah, mightily definitely. in all of our memories. <laughs> but um so comparatively backing Donald Trump's candidacy would be a bargain. Um, <laughs> even if it was a work. I mean, I guess the thing is I I uh I've never really bought the uh the like Donald Trump is working, um, you know, secretly for Hillary bit. Like, <laughs> hey. I've never, that's something that you've heard. It's actually been around a lot. You know, it's been, it's been odd how much it's, uh, it's out there because they were very obviously friendly before, you know, they were at, the Clintons were at Trump's wedding, right? Like, you know, they moved in a lot of the same circles in New York, but, uh, you know, I think it's if we're gonna, you know, call up our good friend Occam and ask him for his razor, he would probably reveal that Trump's and he is, uh, I think, fairly unapologetically an egotist, right? And uh, he found a new circle of friends, as we as we often do, and and uh, you know, for a guy who runs golf courses, being around a lot of big money conservatives uh, is probably not uh, a shock. He fell in with, with that group and, and, you know, at some point made the decision that, you know, enough of these bozos, you better step aside, I'll have a real star run for president and then we'll show you how easy it is. And, you know, for all of his natural <laughs> gifts for which I, I think uh, politically he has a lot, he learned the hard way that it's, you know, you can't just uh, walk in and, and do something. So I think that makes a lot more sense than him intentionally trying to tank an election <laughs> uh, for Hillary Clinton. Because also that would almost necessitate the fact that he leaks everything, right? <laughs> yes. And that all those girls are on the take. Um to to come out uh, and and you know Gloria all reds in on it like it seems a little far fetched right yeah well, although it's a great it's it, it's a great conspiracy theory a great g like Tony the Tiger great okay so <laughs> so I have two questions for you Justin relating directly to this one um, what are the odds okay so you've seen Primary Colors right. Of course, yeah. Okay, so I read the book. Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. What are the odds that I don't know why I was surprised by that? That I, I was surprised by my surprise that you had read the book. That's that's weird. Um, <laughs> I should really give you more credit. Um, what are the odds that there's a movie that comes out directly relating to that conspiracy, or at least very closely aligned to that, similar to the way True, uh, Primary Colors came out right after uh, right after Clinton went through all his. Uh, Fun stuff. Um, well, Primary Colors is kind of a special example because it was written by a fairly liberal reporter and it was presented as, I have to make this fiction or else I will get sued. <laughs> like, and it really did a lot, I think almost more than anything, to codify the reputation of the Clintons and Hillary specifically uh, that we are dealing with today. And, and that is not to say that they have not been proven true. I will leave that to the dear listeners <laughs> of this show to make that determine whether or not the reputation that was laid out for her in her analog character in that book um, you know, has proven to be something that uh, is is carries water. But 
I will say that the idea of her as a conniving, take no prisoners, like super realist, uh, you know, uh, as much of in charge of her husband's campaign as her husband was, um, you know, kind of political operative was laid out in that book before and probably more explicitly than and earlier uh, than anywhere else. Right. Uh, so I think that movie and that book are kind of very unique. You know, I think that those are very rare. Although I think that there is almost no doubt that we will get some sort of film adaptation to whatever the book that um, Heilman and, uh, and and the other guy that do uh, the Game Change books right. uh, come out with. I, I think that that book for this campaign will be insane, and I cannot wait to pre-order it because I cannot wait to read it because everybody on the Trump campaign is going to leak. We're going to get, like you know, a uh, word by word transcripts of people recording shit on voice <laughs> memos. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so I think that there's no doubt we will get a movie version of whatever book they come out with. Cause we already got a movie version of, of, of the Palin stuff, right. you know, yeah. which by the way, was not in any way, the most interesting part of that first book, the Palin stuff, it's all right. I mean, she's the most famous person, so they made the movie out of her, right? But easily, the most tawdry shit in that book was all the reporting that they got on uh, John Edwards and the idea that he had a, a he got some random hippie chick, p- the lunatic, pregnant, while his his wife, who was dying of cancer and was apparently also a major league B. <laughs> to all of their staffers <laughs> uh, was withering away. Like yeah. that's, that's just high, high, high drama. So um, my follow-up question to that is regardless of the outcome of this election, I know thus far you have a single most like your favorite moment, something that even, even if it didn't have a political uh, much of a political play, what was your favorite moment so far of this, uh, you know, even going back into last year, your your favorite moment of this election so far? Favorite moment? Um, like, are we just, all right, so it's something that I personally treasure yeah, yeah. or yeah. I think will kind of echo no, into history? No, Justin's opinion, purely Justin's entertainment value, something that he found either super interesting or just absolutely entertaining. What was your favorite moment? Well, I always love, mm, I love the ostentatious and the awkward. Um, well, uh, Jackie Hearn's asking me about shaking hands with Triumph, which I, I didn't shake hands with Triumph. I, I literally shook Triumph. <laughs> I, I, I shook Rob Spiegel's hand through Triumph. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, if I'm going to think of personal uh, uh, things, then yeah. I mean, uh, obviously becoming a credentialed media pundit and like all of a sudden going from somebody who wants to, uh, you know, uh, talk jive on the internet to having a, a producer and a director point at me and say, hey, have a political opinion. Like that <laughs> was a personal level of amazement. Um, but if I'm going to think of... Uh, all right, so the two that pop into my mind are both from the primary, and it was Jeb doing the please clap thing and Hillary barking like a dog, <laughs> which we've kind of we, we've, we've kind of enshrined on the politics, politics, politics podcast of right. her going like, arf, 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 because uh-huh. you know, the, the fans of Hillary are the hill dogs, and, and they... They arf, arf, arf. Um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, and then, of course, Please Clap, which was, you know, kind of a, a, a oddly edited video, right? But I think was just, is just kind of uh, so indicative of where we are right now with Trump just having his entire campaign alight and on fire. Um, 
while like somebody that sure the, his his greatest sin is having his last name um but at the same time like would have been a fairly steady hand on the rudder um especially against somebody as unpopular as Hillary Clinton but him like standing in front of a dwindling audience in in New Hampshire uh, asking them to please clap is just like such a kind of perfect metaphor for for what uh, what happened during this season. Um, I think my favorite quote this year has been from Hillary Clinton when she was trying to appeal to young people to get them out to vote. And this is back in, what was it, July, July or August, whenever Pokemon Go first came out. And she was like, Pokemon, go to the polls. <laughs> yeah. Reaction. <laughs> There, apparently, in those Podesta emails, uh, mm. she was at some point going to say "Yo, Mama" during a speech, and they, and they, yeah. and they pulled the plug on that. Oh, Trump would have totally did it. He would. <laughs> oh, Trump hey. will say "Yo, Mama" yeah. now. Don Donald, like, oh, Donald, Trump, Donald, Donald, you can't say it. His, Donald, you, you can't say "Yo, Mama" during a speech. Donald, you can't say it. No, I was listening no. to a, a, an interview with Frank Luntz, who is a fairly famous Republican pollster, and he was saying, like, listen, you can't run a successful campaign that doesn't have somebody on staff that can tell the candidate, I will break your fingers if you tweet something that we do not write for you. Right. Yeah, it's right. like... Like that, you can't win unless you have somebody that can do that to the candidate or threaten to quit right. if they don't. Like, hand me your phone, or <laughs> I'm quitting right now. Yeah. Like I'm changing you know, Twitter password. I, only I will know it. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah. And and I think that there's you know there's 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 some truth to that. So if I had to nail down my favorite moment, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go with two. Personally, just on a humor scale, my favorite moment is going to be uh, Howard Dean reliving his yell from from what, four years ago or eight years ago, where whenever it was. No, he didn't. But he didn't. He, he's such a coward. He didn't. He he did the he did the the list. Yeah. But he didn't do the yell. So that that was that was just amazing to me. I, I was like, how you know, digging on yourself from four years ago or or whenever the hell it was. Um, oh, geez, that was longer than that. Was it, that was, was, it, was uh, that was Carrie. That was oh four. Yeah, it, it just so that was just reaching back in the bag like that. It, I, I thought those hilarious. Um, as far as the campaign goes, I remember at one point Hillary Clinton had had told somebody some some reporter somewhere that she was doing her own tweeting. Like that was like a, a point during, a, during an interview. Like, yes, I, I, I do my own tweets. Those are my words. And then during the campaign or during the debates, she's on stage right towards the end and she, her account lights up and she tweets like three times. And I had to reply. I was like, Hey, what happened to do your own tweeting? And I know well, they have publicists and yeah, they have the PA, no, no, PR no, people and stuff like that. It's like, just... Does she have on her thing? Because like the new thing to do is is say like the tweets that are dash hh or like dash bs for Bernie Sanders or something right. like those are from them. Yeah, that dash h is Hillary's <sighs> tweets. So it just, yeah, so kills me. I just I I don't I. Anybody that, that doesn't do their own tweeting, especially if they said that they do, it just, it's like get the hell out of here. It, tweeting is such a a basic thing. You, you, I, it's not like you can I screw up 140 characters unless you're unless you're Trump. Yeah, I think Twitter at the very top. I think it says that tweets from Hillary herself are labeled yeah. in this way. Yeah. yeah, I think that's in her bio. Although that being said, I mean, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm I'm with you. I think that she might have a tricky relationship with telling the truth. We we should really keep an eye on this. I feel like it's, it might be an emerging trend. Yeah, <laughs> that's oh, such man. a new perspective. But yeah, we should we should keep our eye on that. Yeah. Right, um. So real quick, one last thing. Unless uh, unless you guys got something else, I I I fried a turkey this weekend. I did it according to Alton Brown's recipe, like word for word. Yep. I, I went through, and I have never been disappointed by him. I I have a couple of his books right there on ye old bookshelf, 
And I got to tell you, I fried maybe six or eight turkeys in my life. I'm, I'm fairly new to the practice. You know, I've been doing it for a few years, but, you know, I'm really, I'm doing like one every weekend until Thanksgiving. So I, I know I have it down for the Thanksgiving dinner. Um, I got, I, that was the most amazing fried bird I have ever had. It was so good. And man, it's so basic. Like his, his recipes are so simple and so delicious. And it's probably the same thing everybody else does. Some salt, some brown sugar, soak it and let it go. But holy shit, it was delicious. Well, Amos, you know what's going to happen? You're going to, you're going to fry a turkey every weekend until Thanksgiving and you're not going to fucking want turkey. You're going to be pissed off that you did this. Wait, wait, hey, Kent, how long have you known me? When have you ever known me to turn down turkey? Like, this is this is not happening. <laughs> this, this plan seems excessive, though. No, no, like every, two- everybody else is going to be tired of turkey. I'm going to have all the turkey I want all to myself. This is perfect. Oh, okay. So I just looked at it from the wrong angle. <laughs> yes. Okay, got it. This is your Oh, nice. no, it's certainly excessive. Like, there's no doubt about it. That's, that's an excessive plan. But at the same time, I, I appreciate your commitment to the uh, uh, to to like getting this right when it counts. Right. Like yeah. that, that's a, that's that's I appreciate that. All right, can't you get anything else? Uh, yeah, I, I can talk about next week's show. What we have a show next week? Yeah, that's the rumor. What do, what do you mean? So so Justin, we've been doing this countdown to one hundred thing. Yeah, we've been we've been in, in beta for a hundred episodes now, and we're we're trying to figure out if we can actually launch a real podcast. Do you think a Do you think a hundred episodes is a good a good amount for a beta? Usually, yeah, you usually get about um, you know, either where you are or like ninety seven less, like, uh, and then you can decide. Well, we, but it's we, uh, anywhere between three and ninety-seven. Well, we decided right. we would take the Google route on beta and just stay in beta until we knew it was something that we were going to keep doing. And uh, yeah, you know, after a hundred episodes or so, we 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 kind of we're kind of feeling good about you know um, about being in beta. It's it's pretty it fits us pretty good. But I mean, this last uh, this last hun- that we've we've counted to a hundred. Like this is it, man. This we've we've we got one hundred episodes, right? This is this is number one hundred. No, next week. Next, next, next week. week. We gotta do this again. We, we one more time. Oh, what? And then we we are we have completed the road to one hundred. So we basically ten episodes ago we decided we're gonna try to get some really awesome guests, and we did that. We've gotten some really really great people on the show. Uh, Justin Robert Young being the current one, of course. <laughs> He's been great. man. We should we should work on getting that Justin Robert Young guy on. Man, that'd be amazing. That show would be hilarious. When can we do that? <laughs> No, uh, he's overrated <laughs> and probably Iranian. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows. No one uh, knows. Next week, we have a we have an amazing show lined up for next week. We hope. So, oh, it's lined up. <laughs> the last, episode ninety eight was Brian Brushwood. Episode ninety nine was Justin Robert Young. We decided to double that up. Episode one hundred. We've got two amazing guests on. Tom Merritt and Scott Johnson will be our guests. To send us over the top, of 100 episodes. Yeah, so yeah. Can't um, wait. You're both gonna be up at nine West Coast, right? Like we were, we were amazed as well. We we even offered to change the show time. They're like, no, we got it. We're doing, we're good. We're we're gonna do it. Yep. And it, it's been on their calendar for like a month now. Yeah, has it. Yeah, it's. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. God bless them. God bless the <laughs> both of them. They're both beautiful humans. I mean, like there there is like there are a few people that I think. Uh, I, I, I respect more as, as men, like just actual humans than yeah, right. Tom and Scott. They are great people. Um, but yeah, they're, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be our guests next week. That is, uh, as far as we know, set in stone. I mean, set is, is firm. It's set in clay. Let's put it that way. Uh, oh, it's Scott actually stays up late though. Scott, I'll, I'll get a random text from Scott at like 11 <laughs> o'clock. So, you know, I know he's late. Um, and then, uh, we, we're actually going to follow that up. So, so we got to a hundred, we're not going to quit there. We decided to extend the lucky streak of having amazing guests on for one more week after that. And believe it or not, episode one Oh one is going to be a day late, three hours late on that day. We got fucking (laughs) Patrick Beja coming in from, from Paris. We got him coming in for episode one Oh one. Oh man. Patrick's great. Yeah, Patrick's no. so good. 
Here's we, the best thing about Patrick is like that dude kills it on Daily Tech News Show in in uh, a language that is not his primary one. Like you know, whenever whenever uh, like you know, I listen to Patrick Beja and I'm like, I'm like oh man, like Patrick's great. Patrick's amazing. Like Patrick's really really good on that show. It's like oh yeah, like you you could maybe think about being that impressive if you a learned French and then like. Uh, mastered it enough to speak publicly right like like yes. oh yeah, no it's just you know easy that's easy to do yeah J- jk it's super hard and he's amazingly talented um he's he has he has three podcasts that i know of um pixels uh dtns of course because he's a weekly contributor on that and then also um the phileas club all in english and all of them, all three of those shows are. are but then great. he's got other French language ones. He, too, he's right? he's got a whole slew of French language stuff. It's it, he's he's an amazing person, a, a great podcaster, and we can't wait he's to have him. He's the Howard so. Stern of French podcasting. <laughs> he's the Ira Glass of French <laughs> podcasting. I was gonna I was gonna say the Howard Stern. I don't know. I don't, maybe I need to learn French because holy shit. <laughs> so hey, Jerry. Um, they get, uh, they get wild out there. Uh, it, it, Jerry, where can uh, where can people find? In case they're watching this and they don't know, because I don't I don't even know how that's possible. But just in case we got a brand new listener, you know, more than our typical two, um, where can people find out more about you? Go ahead and get me, Justin R. Young, everywhere, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. <laughs> it's uh, it's all there. It's waiting for you uh. at uh, Justin R. Young. Um, politics, politics, politics. That's not three shows. That's one. Uh, yeah, it's one show. We're doing three days a week until the election. So I really only have like six more episodes. And then yeah. after that, we will see. We'll, we'll, we'll be wondering, huh? I mean, you'll do at least one more after the, after the election. That's, that's kind of a given, but you gotta do a postmortem, right? <laughs> I feel like we're doing it now, though. That's the weirdest thing. It's, I, I feel like we're just kind of like, you know, I'm going to have Michael Shore on, who was my, he was the chief political correspondent for BitTorrent News, which may or may not still exist. It is, it is Schrodinger's news uh, organization. It, it both exists and doesn't exist at the same time. Um, uh, but uh, I feel like I want to have him on, and literally it's like, no, like, we're going to have to postmortem this uh, right now before it's dead because not to say that it's for sure that Hillary's going to win because even if Trump won it would just be another surprise in a campaign jam packed with insane surprises mm-hmm. right so it's like i feel like we can fairly accurately tell the tale and the ending even if it's a shock ending would fit perfectly in the story we're going to tell like either it ends with Trump as this Icarus looking motherfucker who who finally flew too close to the sun and has now crashed thunderously back down to earth on his melted wings of wax. Or it's again, you counted him out again, and he and he stuffed it right in your mouth again. His name is Donald J. Trump. Mm. Um, th- um so politics, politics, politics. You got night attack on Tuesday nights live on diamondclub.tv. You got the jury show, which it, 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 it is as of yet undecided when exactly you're going to fit that in since you're so busy on Sundays now. Is that is that what's going on with that? Oh, no, I don't know. I was I think I was just feeling in a low energy. Yeah, well, that particular Sunday or I, over the last few Sundays, but we'll see. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to change it like it, it fits now. Like, you know, at this point, we'd have to feel where else in my schedule uh, they would cry, less cry out in pain for me to put it there. Definitely not Wednesday nights. <laughs> we, we've we've tried really oh hard. God. Well, number one, anything I do would be before when you guys are doing it. Like this is, this is same, insane. It's, it's same with us. Like we, <laughs> you know how hard it is to try to find a good spot on DiamondClub.tv now because there's so much good stuff out there. It gets it's well, in, not just and not just that. You are in Alaska. Yeah, for you to. On any earlier is just ridiculous. Yeah. So there's. Wait, that. are you are you later than Pacific? Uh, we are one hour after Pacific, so it is it is oh, nine thirty right now. Gross and weird. I didn't know that was even a thing. That's weird <laughs> and gross. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, hey, Jerry, we've been doing a little thing uh, called uh, Ritual Liberty, 
that um well I'll let I'll let Kent introduce it. He does such a fine job. <laughs> So th throughout the show, we've been secretly selecting words from the show. It could be something you said, something me, me or Amos said, um, but we just kind of been cherry picking either favorite words or answers to questions or whatever, and plugging them into a document that pre-fills everything into a, a, a Mad Lib style story. Wow. Okay. Th this is so how we make the sausage. This is, this, yeah. This is the this is the <laughs> Justin Robert Young version. And it is what? It, what do we have this week, Amos? Is this a um, this is a political speech? Isn't uh, it? Uh, uh, Justin, you're 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 you've been into politics for years, and, and the question has come up on whether or not you would ever uh, entertain the idea of running for office. And and me and Kent got to thinking, and and you know, if if you ever do run for office, you're going to need some amazing speech writers. So I'm about to sure, read yeah. you a, a a a draft. I mean, it's only a draft. It's only something we threw together. It's a draft. Of a a, uh, a presidential speech um, uh, for you, in case you ever run. This is me and Kent's audition to become your speechwriters. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, on this independent occasion, it is a privilege to address such an auspicious-looking group of shit shows. I can tell from your smiling pussy tapes that you will support my debatable program in the coming election. I promise that if elected, there will be a magic trick in every tea bag and two virtual boys in every garage. I want to warn you against my gay-friendly opponent, opponent, Mr. Brushwood. A man, the man is nothing but a conniving byproduct. He has a tawdry character and is working greatest in, and is working greatest in glove with the criminal element. If elected, I promise to eliminate vice. I will keep the hands of the city's streets. I will keep crooks from dipping their faces in the public till. I promise you a J.O. kind of government, insane taxes, and needless schools. Thank you. Jeez. That's a hell of a speech, boys. Hell of a speech. I'll tell you what, I think we're taking this one all the way to the White House. <laughs> <laughs> we never go to Nebraska and then uh, North Dakota. And then uh, you're right, Tom Harkin. <laughs> Bow! Hey, Kent, man, where can people find more, more of your stuff at, dude? Oh, get on Twitter and look up at RM underscore Del Noche. If you're a beer guy like me, go to ratebeer.com and check out my over 500 reviews. Username Del Noche. Where are you at, Amos? Uh, first of all, you need to get this one on your little review list because it was uh, it was tasty. You need to send me some of that. I, I need to find a way. Hey, we we never got any of that uh, that beer that Justin and uh, and Brian were pushing. We need to we need to make it make that happen too. Um, hey, uh, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ethan Kane. Uh, yeah, it's not my name. I don't care. Fuck you. And, uh, you can find the show at ritualmisery.com. You can find it at ritual misery on the Twitter. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do. You can call and leave us a voicemail five, six, seven, T six, nine TRMPC. That's five, six, seven, six, nine, eight, seven, six, seven, two. You can, um, uh, you can go to our website, ritualmisery.com. You can feed back there. You can go. Uh, you can go to Reddit. We have a Reddit, ritualmisery.reddit.com. We weren't supposed to read that because the ending is getting too long, but fuck it, did anyway. And I would like to thank Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use his music for this podcast. Thank you for listening, for Kent, for me, and for you. This is my mismatched jury podcast. <laughs> Peace out. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> okay, so I typically fuck up the intro. This time I fucked up the outro. Uh, I think that counts. <laughs>